da 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 Welcome to the Illuma Newsroom! da 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 it's here! The last batch of cards for Rise of the Floodborne has been added to the Lorcana app. There are a lot, so let's get into them. First, there's a truckload of new vanillas. Eudora, Accomplished Seamstress, a 1-9 2 lore for 5, a very survivable stat line for a quester. Piglet, very small animal, a 2-4 2 lore for 3. Fairy Godmother here to help, a 3-7 2 lore for 5. Arthur, Trained Swordsman, a 4-3 2 lore for 4 with some fantastic art. Tiana, True Princess, a 5-3 3 lore for 5, also with fantastic art. Bone, Precocious on Entrepreneur, a Donald Boisterous clone. Caterpillar, Calm and Collected, a 133 lore for 3. Very nice seeing that much lore for so cheap, and again, killer art. Rabbit, Reluctant Host, a 462 lore for 5. It's a little sad that most of the Winnie the Pooh rep in this set is vanillas. Pacha, Village Leader, a 482 lore for 6. Tiana, Diligent Waitress, a 131 lore for 1. Of most interest are the Queen Regal Monarch, the new Sitch clone, as she is the perfect shift target for commanding presence, letting you play the Floodborne on turn 2 and immediately quest or sing. It's also good seeing more villains and Amber, maybe one day King of Olympus will actually be relevant. Similarly, there is Hercules, Hero in Training, a 2-3-1 lore for 2 who can serve as a shift target for Divine Hero. Heck, you can play Hero in Training into True Hero and then shift onto whomever survives. Moving to actual cards, we get another Amber Villain, Gaston, Baritone Bully, a 3-3-1 lore for 3 with Singer 5. Basically the poor man's spectacular singer. I don't see him replacing her in the Amber Steel song deck, but he could supplement her as he's better in a challenge. Next is Mulan, Free Spirit, a 2-3-2 lore for 3 with support. Presumably this is the intended shift target for reflecting, but she's not the worst thing on her own. As a shift target, it's interesting that you're being forced to be ink inefficient, like you're expected to shift on turn 4, leaving you with 2 ink to spend on something else if you'd like. I think that would have been more appropriate for the Queen, though, as her on-quest ability is irrelevant without other characters on your board, whereas reflecting can sing songs for you starting whenever. I'm not sure it's worth running Free Spirit as a shift target, as you'd be shifting her the turn you'd be playing her normally anyway, so while you're really getting is sacrificing free spirit to quest immediately and hope to play a song. Then we have Nana, a 1-3-1 one, one lore for 2 with when you play a Floodborne, remove all damage from a character. It's nice seeing this cycle complete, though I'm not sure how much play Nana will really see. Decks trying to combo off of healing want to remove damage one at a time to get as many triggers as possible, so fully healing kind of neuters that, maybe in an Amber Steel deck that wants to challenge a lot. Much better for the healing archetype is Snow White, Lost in the Forest, a 2-3-1 one lore for 2 with when you play her, heal heal someone for two. This is just a better mini Beloved Princess. This is a must run in any healing combo deck, and anytime you'd run Beloved Princess, you may as well run this instead. Snow White also gets a Floodborne. Wellwisher, a 3-5-2 lore for six, unequable with shift four, and when she quests, return a character from your discard to your hand. This is insane. Being able to get back characters repeatedly without spending ink is an absurd amount of value. This is absolutely a chase card, and I think she will see play in a lot of decks. The last new Amber card is Sleepy Flute, a 2 ink unequable item that can be exerted to gain a lore if you've played a song this turn. Beautiful! Run 4 copies of this in any song based deck and get your free lore. Who needs characters? I absolutely want to try to build a deck that just runs this and a whole bunch of songs, and maybe Sorcerer's Spellbook for a bit more consistency and no characters at all. It's probably not really a viable idea yet, but as we get more songs, I want to try it. An Amethyst first up is Dr. Facilier, Savvy Opportunist, a 4 2 1 lore for 4 with Evasive. So this guy is an on curve shift target for Agent Provocator, but I think he's going to be more at home in an evasive focus deck, as that 2 health makes him less likely to survive direct damage removal. Next is the most bonkers thing I've seen in quite a while, Fairy Godmother Mystic Armorer. Now this is a Floodborne. She's a 3-4 2 lore for 5 with shift 2, and when she quests, all your characters get Challenger plus 3, and when they're banished in a challenge this turn, return them to your hand. This is ridiculous, not the least of which because the ability name is so dope, forget the coach, here's a sword. So if you're Shifting onto Pure Heart, you could first spend two on Night and Training to trigger and exert, then shift out Mystic Armor, quest, and send your one and or two drop at whatever you just exerted, and if they die, you get to use them again! This is an utterly wild card, and I like that it seems to be shifting Amethyst's focus away from just draw cards and stall, and actually push for a win con. Then we have Hey Hey, Persistent Presence, a 2 on one lore for two, with when he's banished in a challenge, return him to your hand. The art and concept is delightful, but the main deck I see him seeing play in is in an Amethyst Ruby deck with Sheer Con, 
not letting you get an extra challenges with the same card over and over again for a lot cheaper than Marshmallow. Moving to Amethyst's items, we have Binding Contract for 4 ink. Uninkable, you can exert it to exert one of your characters to exert an opposing character. Exert, exert, exert. My first thought is using this to exert Christopher Robin the turn you play him so he can ready on your next turn and start getting your extra lore sooner. Because the Binding Contract doesn't specify that the ink has to be dry, you can exert any character. This is a funky little card and I look forward to trying out some weird things with it. Finally, we have Croquet Mallet, a 1 ink uninkable item that you can banish to give a character rush. So a one-time use pocket watch that's also just strictly better than Cut to the Chase, which remains pretty useless. I love that you can pre-play this and just have it sit on the board waiting for your Heroic Outlaw or Heartless to come out immediately swinging. In Emerald, we have another Dr. Facilier Fortune Teller, a 4-4-3 lore for 7 with Evasive, and when he quests, an opposing character can't quest on their next turn. So this kind of suffers the same problem as Mother Gothel, where he doesn't do anything the turn you play him, which becomes a bit of an issue at 7 ink or higher. Sure, if he survives around, he's very, very good, but he needs to survive. I will say I do like him better than the Mother Gothel because of his evasive, and I could see him being the top end of an evasive deck. Next is Gaston Scheming Suitor, a 1-3-1 one, one lore for 2, who gets plus 2 strength if your opponent's hand is empty. So, a worse Prince Eric. Spoiler alert for a bit later, but Intellectual Powerhouse does not get an in-color shift target, so if you want to shift him out, you'll need to pair Sapphire with Amber, Ruby, or Emerald, this being your choice in Emerald. And honestly, he's pretty bad. I could only see this being played in Limited. There are better things to be doing with your time in a discard deck than a conditional 3-3. At least Bookworm gets more lore. Then we have Pain, Underworld Imp, a 1-4, one, 1 lore for 2, with if he has 5 or more strength, he gets plus 2 lore pips, so clearly he's intended to be played with Panic, who immediately gets into the requisite strength amount to quest for 3 on turn 3. 3 lore on turn 3, and he's a lot more survivable than Star Attraction. I could see a deck trying to get these two together, maybe paired with Sapphire to get some support going. People have been waiting for him, it's Pete, bad guy. A 3-4-2 lore for 5 with Ward, and whenever you play an action, he gets plus 2 strength for the turn, and if he has 7 or more strength, he gets plus 2 lore. So those are some solid stats. Even just having a warded 3-4-2 lore for one more ink than usual is pretty sweet, but in a support focus deck, the same kind that would run Pain, you can get some serious lore out of Pete. Heck, just playing Work Together on Panic will do the trick. Jesus, did Pete just make Work Together viable? What a world we're living in! The final Emerald card is Radigan Criminal Mind, a 4-1-2 lore for 4 with Evasive, so I prefer Evasives to have willpower focus stats. Being evasive means they can avoid challenges, but that doesn't let them avoid direct damage. Criminal Mind dies to literally anything. I don't see him replacing Pongo. He should slay in Limited, though. In Ruby, we get Felicia, always hungry, a 3-1-0 lore for 1 with Reckless. I love her. She is there to eat your opponent's 1-drop, and she will do that. If you give her Mouse Armor turn 2, she might even survive. Sure, she's worse than Forceful Duelist, but that's a very high bar to meet, and I think a Ruby deck paired with any color other than Steel would be quite happy to run Felicia. I've been waiting for her, and she is glorious. Lady Tremaine, Imperious Queen, a 3-4-2 lore Floodborne for 6 uninkable with Shift 4, and when you play her, each opponent chooses and banishes one of their characters. This hits everyone, and it gets around Ward, which is the best thing. Opponent plays a Cusco, you drop this, get rid of it, and you never hear about it again. I think we're going to see Lady Tremaine Imperious Queen getting a lot of play and a lot of ruby decks. Next is Namari Nemesis, a 3-3-1 lore for 4, uninkable, and you can exert and banish her to banish another character. So a cheaper, delayed Dragonfire, essentially. A Dragonfire that sits there on the board, waiting menacingly. Now, if she's removed before she can do her job, well, you kind of wasted her, but at least that removal was used on her and not something you actually want to keep around to quest with. So, mixed bag, I suppose. I think she'll be very good and limited where removal is harder to come by. Then we get what might be my favorite card in the entire set, Queen of Hearts. Sensing Weakness, a 4-3-1 lore Floodborne for 5 with Shift 2, and whenever you challenge, draw a card! Ha <laughs> ha! Any challenge, not just with her, so having her and Shere Khan in play means for every challenge you draw a card and gain a lore. I need to build this deck. This is an insane deck, and I need to build it. I need my Ruby Steel Challenge Focus deck like yesterday. This is one of the best uncommons ever printed. The final Ruby card is What Did You Call Me? A 1 ink action that gives a damaged character plus 3 strength to the turn. So that's better than he's got a sword, but no one plays. He's got 
got a sword, the fact that the character needs to be damaged is also kind of meh. I don't see a world where this sees play, except maybe limited if you're desperate. Moving to Sapphire, we get Duke Weaselton, a 1 2 2 lore for 2 with Ward. So the card itself is fine, a decent quester that can't be hit by targeted damage, but I just gotta say, I kinda hate the meta joke about this character's name. It just took me out of the movie. It's one thing to have Easter eggs, it's another entirely to halt the movie in its tracks and remind you that you're watching a movie. Anyway, next up is James, a 3 3 2 lore for 4 uninkable. With when he's banished, you can put him in your inkwell, so a bigger Grandma Tala. The great thing about Grandma is she's cheap, so you can get her out early, and she's inkable, so late game you can ink her to play something more important. James is neither of those things. I think he'll be good in Limited, as he's a decent quester, and getting to ink him when he dies will be a nice consolation. But in Constructed, there's just no room for a card this slow. Then we have Jasmine, heir of Agrabah, who is a color-shifted grub wrestler. She might see play in a Grand Peppy deck, but that's it. Next. Noi, Orphaned Thief, is a 1-2-2 two, two lore for 2, with if you have an item, she gets resist plus 1 and ward. So, kind of the same deal as Duke Weaselton, except now conditional. She'll be best in an item-focused deck, but she doesn't really add anything to an item-focused deck. I suppose you could use Shield of Virtue to start spamming lore, but that's going to use up a lot of ink early on, and you want to be using that ink to play other things or ramp, which is what Sapphire wants to do. Donald Strutting works well with Shield, because by the time he's starting to quest, you have extra ink left over to play play other things. Next is our third ward card, the Knock Water Spirit, who is otherwise a 4-3-1 lore for 4. I don't think this will see any play outside limited. One lore is just not enough for the Shield of Virtue trick to get you to 20 quickly enough. Finally, we have Maurice's Workshop, a 3-ink uninkable item with when you play another item, you can pay 1 ink to draw a card. That is very nice. I don't know if this will replace Maurice entirely, but it does let you start getting that draw going much sooner. I think this card is going to make item decks a lot more viable, and I think we'll start seeing them a lot more. Moving to Steel, we have yet another beast, Selfless Protector, a 2-8-1 lore for 6 with when one of your other characters would be damaged, damage him instead. So he's got super extra bodyguard in a way, but it's not just being challenged. Let's say you have Sensing Weakness on the board that you played last turn. She swings into someone, deals 4 damage, but any damage she would take goes into Selfless Protector instead. He's essentially handing unlimited resist for as long as he has health left. In fact, he would be the best target for giving resist to like with mouse armor. There are so many things you can do with this guy, and I only have time to scratch the surface. Next is Benja, Guardian of the Dragon Gem, a 2 3 2 lore for 3 with when you play him, banish an item. Now we have redundancy with hard headed, and if items start being more prominent in the meta, and I'm quite sure they will be, I think Benja will see play here and there as a tech card. Now our last, final, no more left to reveal, 204th out of 204 cards is Kronk Jr. Chipmunk. He's a 4 5 2 lore for 6 with resist plus 1, and when he banishes, Banishes a character in a challenge, he does 2 damage to a character. So he's Giant Fairy without the on-play effect or the shift, but he's got resist, which means he can stick around for more challenges. Hmm. He has the same cost as Heartless, and while I quite like Takashi, isn't really used in a lot of decks because he's relatively slow. I think Kronk will see play in the same sorts of decks that already want to play Heartless, or maybe even just to have some redundancy with Giant Fairy. And after all, he's immune to the on-play effect of enemy Giant Fairies. We did it! We went through through 204 cards drip slowly over the course of about a month or so, I'm personally pretty excited, and thanks to the restock that finally made it to my end of the world, I finally have more of the first chapter, and it sounds like I'll be able to get a decent amount of packs for Rise of the Floodborne as well. I can't wait to try out all these new cards. I hope you all can find product and pull the cards you want. Comment below which Rise of the Floodborne card you are most looking forward to playing with.